Ε, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που ήρθατε σήμερα. Πιστεύουμε να είναι ε, αρκετά, να, να σας χρησιμεύσει πολύ η σημερινή ημερίδα, να δούμε πού πηγαίνει η χώρα, να ακούσουμε τι κάνουν ε, άλλες χώρες ε, στο εξωτερικό, πώς συντονίζουν τις πολιτικές τους, τι κάνουν σε επίπεδο ε, χρηματοδοτών έρευνας και σε επίπεδο των φορέων που διεξάγουν έρευνα με την ανοιχτή πρόσβαση, πώς διατίθεται η έρευνα και τέλος πάντων πώς μπορούμε και εμείς κάπως να συντονιστούμε για να προχωρήσουν η χώρα, τα ιδρύματά μας και οι φορείς που χρηματοδοτούν έρευνα προς την κατεύθυνση της μεγαλύτερης ανοιχτότητας προς την έρευνα και ελπίζουμε τελικά και προς την κατεύθυνση που μας οθεί και η Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή. Η οποία θα μας πει που μας οθεί τώρα και με αυτό θέλω να παρουσιάσω τον πρώτο μας καλεσμένο, τον κύριο τον δόκτωρα Ζαν Φρανσουά Ντεσά. Να τον ευχαριστήσουμε που είναι μαζί μας σήμερα. Είναι ο Φισερ που είναι υπεύθυνο για το έργο με Doanet, το Mediterranean Open Access Network, το οποίο, όπως είπε η κυρία Σαχήνση, βοηθάει στο συντονισμό πολιτικών σε μεσογειακό επίπεδο για την ανοιχτή πρόσβαση. Και θα σας πω δύο μόνο λόγια. Ε, ασχολείται με, το, ε, με τα θέματα πολιτικής ανοιχτή πρόσβασης στην Κομισιόν, ο κ. Δεσάμ, και είναι στην Γενική Διεύθυνση Έρευνας ε, και καινοτομία. Ξεκίνησε την καριέρα του στο Συμβούλιο της Ευρώπης και έχει εργαστεί σε φαρμακευτικές εταιρείες και κυρίως, πολύ σημαντικό, ε, ξεκίνησε ουσιαστικά και δούλεψε για αρκετό καιρό στην καμπάνια για την πρόσβαση σε βασική φαρμακευτική περίθαλψη στους γιατρούς χωρίς σύνορα ε, πριν μετακομίσει να μας διευρύνει τους ορίζοντές μας για την ανοιχτή πρόσβαση στην ε, Κομισιόν. Θα μας πει λοιπόν σήμερα για την θέση της ανοιχτή πρόσβασης στην Κομισιόν, τι έχει γίνει μέχρι στιγμής και τα σχέδια βέβαια και για το, για το επόμενο χρηματοδοτικό πακέτο θα τα ακούσετε λεπτομερώς. Και να δώσω το βήμα στον κύριο Ντεσά. Thank you, thank you, Victoria. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be, to be here today, as I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Sakini, Dr. Tsukras, or Evi, Victoria, for thinking of us uh, when preparing the, uh, the program of this, uh, of this workshop. Um, my intention today, in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, is just to give you um, a flavor of uh, what we're doing, what we've been doing, and what we intend to continue to do. But what I want also to, to stress is that nothing that we do on open access makes sense uh, if it doesn't make sense for you. Uh, what I want to say is that we, we need you as much as maybe modestly you may need us. Uh, we should not work in isolation. Working in the European Commission is not easy every day because there are so many important, other important issues to cover that we always have to fight also internally to bring open access to, to a certain level. Maybe it's the same for you in your university, in your, in your research centers or wherever you work, to, uh, to all, always remind that open access is something that can really make a difference if everyone makes a little effort. So that's my little introduction. We always start with, uh, with a rationale for, for policy. So uh, the question is, why do we care? What do we want? And what the European Union in general, the European Commission more precisely wants, is to simply optimize the impact of scientific research results when there are public funds involved. So it's as simple as that. Doing that for us, for the uh, the work, for our own work programs, so for our own activities, or the one that we finance directly, but also we believe this is also good for the 27 member states of the European Union. So you see already two levels of activities: the expect expected impacts that we always also have to um, remind to the people we talk to internally or to our stakeholders uh, outside, is. Um, is important. So we have, uh, we have to always put ahead the uh, fact that um, a, a better circulation of knowledge is uh, good for uh, a better innovation in the, in the sense that it accelerates the innovation. It's good for the economic growth in general. It is good for a better science in general because science builds on previous results. You very rarely start from scratch. It is good for a more efficient science to avoid duplication, avoid doing research that has already been done, whatever field, and use more 
people in clinical trials, more animals in some biotech research, etc. And basically, it's just about improving transparency. That is also involving citizens and the society in general. One slide which is also stating the obvious, but again, we have constantly to remind that open access are two very simple words. But um, when we talk to some people, they say, oh, yes, I know what open access is. No, they don't. So we always have to, uh, to remind them that we talk about online access at no charge to the user. We talk about peer-reviewed scientific publications and research data, and there are lots of different data in that category. We always have to remind our colleagues, other stakeholders, that it's not about stealing knowledge. Uh, there's no interference with patenting, for instance. So always keep repeating the same things, but that's basic work that we have to do in policy making. And last but not least, you know about the two main models, maybe more than two, but we always have to explain gold open access. So when the costs are covered in a way or the other, usually by the authors or the um, institution behind them, so for immediate <coughs> open access. And we have to explain also <coughs> what green open access is with the deposit of the manuscript. So that's, again, another uh, very obvious slide, but it's, I insist, when you, in your work, with, uh, when you talk to people who don't know exactly what to do, it's always important to, to remind the basics. And then, what are the benefits of open access, because from uh, general improved circulation of knowledge, we go down to open access. So again, it's to say that with open access, the results of publicly funded research can be disseminated in a fashion that is uh, broader and uh, faster. And who benefits from that? Everyone, other researchers, innovative industries, and the citizens, all of us. What is also important for us as the European Commission is to remind that we try to um, consider as much as possible the situation of 20 different member states. And what is also very important is to consider an equal access across Europe, of course, also beyond. But we believe that if you're a Greek researcher in Greece, if you are a French researcher in Portugal or Finnish in the UK, whatever, that you have the same as much as possible the same access, the same rights. And if you move also from one country to the other in Europe, that you usually don't go down in terms of uh, access to knowledge. So this is something which is very close to our heart. And last but not least about open access, there's always the, economical, the direct economic benefit, is to drive down the costs of dissemination, but of course, without sacrificing quality. As you know, uh, politics in the European Union are very complicated. So I am from uh, the European Commission. You see that nice building on top of the slide, which is uh, led by a group of 27 um, uh, commissioners, as a president, but also vice presidents and other commissioners. So this is the big house I'm working in. But we are not working in isolation. And uh, most of the decisions that are taken at the level of the Commission, despite what you can hear in the journals, does not come directly from the Commission alone. But uh, in most of the decision-making process, you have the European Parliament, especially also what we call the Council, that is the representatives of the member states. So usually you have the three institutions working together uh, in terms of uh, policy-making. So the European Commission, as far as uh, open access is concerned and the general dossier of uh, research, innovation, and circulation of uh, scientific knowledge is concerned, has got basically three hats. So it's, I think, also quite interesting to, uh, to remind that to you today. The first one, which is the obvious, is that we are policy maker in the sense that we have uh, various departments that can prepare legislation or legal text, text with a certain legal weight, I would say. But um, as I said with the previous slide, we, as the European Commission, legislate with other EU institutions. So I mentioned the Parliament and the Council. You have also some consultative bodies that are important. But we are rarely alone 
in this. And also something which is very important, as the European Commission, we can invite member states to act. We have a bit, much more, we have a bit more freedom on that. So keep this also in mind for the next slide when I will present the, um, our most recent activities. The second hat that we wear is as a funding agency, and that you know, uh, through our research framework programs, FP7 is the current one. There is a new name for the following one, which is not FP8, but it's called Horizon 2020. It's been rebranded. And as a funding agency, we are responsible for the money that is spent. That means that we're also responsible for setting the rules for access and dissemination. Again, keep this in mind for the next slides. And the third hat that we have is broader, uh, uh, so we can call it a capacity builder. And this is where you find our activities related, related to um, infrastructure projects and the funding that we, that we have. Everything that is relevant, the, um, can I say the, yeah, the structure, the, the backbone, that is absolutely necessary for a good open access practice. And uh, yes, and then there are those uh, various projects uh, such as Open Air, for instance, that we'll mention very, uh, very shortly. It's always um, nice, I think, to put some faces. It, it helps to memorize a little bit the situation. So as I said, the European Commission is complex. Of course, being complex, you need to have two departments working on open access. So that means that you have two big bosses, uh, uh, two commissioners. The first one is one of the vice presidents, Neely Cruz, who is a, a Dutch national. She is responsible with all the services for what we call the digital agenda and the digital single market. So it's basically very horizontal, everything that is connected to uh, internet, uh, the cloud computing, and of course, infrastructure, data, uh, cultural data, etc., like Europeana. So this is uh, the remit of uh, digital agenda. And then you have another department where the top head is Commissioner Maura Gagan Queen. From the complex name, you can understand she's Irish. And she's responsible with her team uh, for research and innovation. And this is where I work. And the big dossiers are FP7 and Horizon 2020, but also a few other concepts like uh, the European Research Area, I will explain, and Innovation Union. So with our department, we're a bit more vertical, if you want, because this is where you find also most of the, uh, uh, of the activity work programs. And I work in a program which is called Science in Society that connects as it said, science and society, so we have open access, but we deal also with other issues, to give you an idea, like uh, gender issues, governance, ethics, for instance. So I talked about, uh, with the second slide, about the uh, policy objectives, but uh, let's wrap this up with the concrete objectives. So what do we want to achieve? Basically, we want to develop and implement open access to research results from projects funded by our own programs, FP7 and Horizon 2020. And of course, that includes um, funding for research and support activities in the area of open access with programs, uh, projects such as Medwanet, for instance. So this is for us, but the second part is to encourage a national policy uh, all the national policy initiatives. I think this is also one of my reasons for being here today. And not only having member states working nationally, but also try to contribute as much as possible to something coherent within the European Union and having all the member states going into the same direction. Of course, everyone with their own path and their own specificities, but that we go into the same direction. One slide quickly to explain a little bit what, uh, what is the situation for the moment regarding open access in FP7. It's not exhaustive, but just to give you um, uh, another flavor. 
You may know, I hope, the uh, Open Access Pilot in FP7 that we have started in 2008, and that concerns about 20% of the total budget of FP7 with uh, seven areas uh, that are concerned. This is to date about 1,300 projects. And um, I'm not going to enter into details, I don't have the time, but uh, we did also a survey last year, which I think was interesting for us to take a little bit of the temperature with the project coordinators. What is important is that, uh, independently from the pilot, the uh, open access publishing costs for gold open access are eligible in FP7, so whether you are part of the pilot or not, um, if you want to have your cost reimbursed for gold open access, you can. But the problem is that it's only limited to the duration of the project, of the length of the grant agreement with the Commission. It's a legal issue. The European Research Council, it is part of the European Commission um, um, galaxy, I, if I may say, that they target more individual researchers in terms of grants. So they have also some uh, guidelines on open access. Interestingly enough, they have uh, a different embargo. I will, I will show you the next one, on the next slide. Uh, a very short embargo of six months for all, for green open access for all areas. So even also for the social sciences and the humanities, for instance. So it is quite short. And they have also some policy already on um, open access to data, to primary data. Last but not least, open air. Not going to say much about it, uh, except that we are very happy with open air. And it's been extremely helpful at the time of the, um, of the pilot. And we believe it's going to be very important to support the open access mandate in Horizon 2020. Now, three key documents that we have produced and that we have issued last summer. First, an introduction about the terminology. You see in green, because I think this is clickable, uh, two are communication. One is a recommendation just to explain in 30 seconds the different um, documents in the Commission. A communication is the first level and it's quite a general document quite free in its form, where the Commission just announces certain things. Then you have a recommendation that starts to be a bit more structured with um, recitals and such, so where the Commission recommends member states to do certain things, but it's always not binding. And then you have um, a directive and then uh, basically a law uh, that can be directly implemented. So we have the four different levels. But the first document, communication, I will not say much. It's a very broad uh, document that explains the vision of the European research area. Uh, I will show you the next slide. And then our scientific information package with those two documents, a communication which is focusing on Horizon 2020, so our own program, and a recommendation to the member states with a focus then on, on every country. So the communication basically the idea uh, of this era, European Research Area, is um, an internal market where the researchers, the results, the technology, everything circulates freely. It's rather a concept that we're trying to, uh, we've been trying for years to, to implement. And one of the areas is optimal circulation, access to, and transfer of scientific knowledge. So there's something about open access there, but also with, uh, with pattern, for instance. So I would not say much, but it's for us, it's important because somehow open access is encapsulated into something big, and that's a little bit our locomotive. Second document, so still issued in July last year, is our communication called Towards Better Access to Scientific Information. Basically, we explain a little bit the uh, methodology to our madness, so why we are here and what do we want, etc. And uh, I think everything is clear on the, um, on, on, on the slide. I would like to invite you to have a look at this document and you will understand better what, we, uh, what is our 
yeah, what we have in mind. But basically, the focus is on Horizon 2020 and explaining what we would like to do uh, as far as open access is concerned. So what we would like to do is this. On the left hand, you have the situation as it is in FP7, and in the right, this is what we have been proposing for um, Horizon 2020. So from a pilot in FP7 uh, with um, an obligation to make best effort, it's a legal terminology, to provide open access, we want to go to a simple obligation to provide open access to publications. Where there were before seven areas, we want all areas to be covered, absolutely all of them. We still talk about peer-reviewed publications. We are less clear when it comes to books, monographs, etc., because we know it raises many concerns. And in, as far as green open access was concerned, in the uh, FP7 uh, pilot, the embargo is six months for all uh, of the five fields, but 12 months for the two fields dealing with social sciences and humanities, and we would keep that. That is six months for all the fields, except for peer-reviewed scientific publications in the field of so social sciences and the humanities. On top, in Horizon 2020, we've been proposing also a pilot for research data. We still have a few months to, to work on that. We start a little bit late, but we, uh, we are working on that to define the, the details. But of course, the interest, commercial interest or whatever, would be protected. In terms of open access publishing costs, so as I said, they are uh, eligible uh, while the project runs. We would like to keep the same possibility in Horizon 2020. But if possible, and it's not going to be easy, also allow for a certain period of time after the project has finished, so the contract is, is over, to have some sort of extra money in order to reimburse a few uh, gold open access publications. But don't hold your breath, because it's, um, it's quite difficult, legally speaking, but we will see. So Horizon 2020, uh, on this slide, you have a little bit of a different sort of information, but what I want to say is that we made a proposal for open access in Horizon 2020 in November last year, but I come back to one of my first slides, we are not alone. So the, the European Parliament and the Council, that is the representatives of the member states, including Greece, have discussed also all, absolutely every aspect of the proposal and including also open access. And they, um, they have, of course, some uh, amendments. The process is finished in the Council. It's finishing in the, uh, in the European Parliament. So the next stage is uh, for next year for the three institutions to revise every single amendment and try to have a combined text that pleases absolutely everyone. So we hope that our proposal is not going to be tainted. Don't think so. It's been quite fine, but this gives you an idea also of the, the way we are working as European institutions. So the objective is end of 2013 for the adoption of the uh, full package, the Legislative Act, so that Horizon 2020 can start in 2014. I mentioned briefly the uh, pilot on open access to data. So we're going to develop it, and as I said, take into account all questions about privacy, security, commercial interests. This idea raised lots of questions in the Parliament and in the Council, and we know we have to answer uh, those concerns. Uh, what data, in what area, where should the data go, etc. What about the ownership? So, um, and it's also bigger than just open access to data is just bigger than that. It's just about data sh sharing, data management, preservation. So it's, it's much more than just sharing. We know it, and we are work this is why also we work with our colleagues from the other departments uh, of the digital agenda. The recommendation to member states, so that's the third document adopted uh, in July. 
So basically, we try to, uh, to be coherent and ask member states to do things that are similar to what we are trying to do for our own program. So in that document, you will see um, the various um, uh, sections on open access to publications, to data, the question of preservation and reuse of scientific information, and also the e-infrastructure. Again, the idea is to be consistent, member states and the European Commission with the Horizon 2020. We also put forward the idea of a structured coordination with the Commission and representatives of the member states to be sure that everyone goes in the same direction, maybe not at the same path, but at least in a coherent <coughs> way uh, altogether. I put, yes, the, the, the title in, in Greek. I would really encourage you to, uh, to go on our website and just click on, uh, uh, on the link to the recommendation, find it in Greek and read it. It's just like five, six pages, and it gives you a bit an idea of, uh, of the general um, uh, content of uh, our policy. Or just one slide to, you don't, I don't want to spend too much time because I think it's, time is running as well. But just to say that we have started working on open access in 2006 with uh, one person, then we were three, then we are two again. Um, so it's lots of work, but uh, some may criticize it is slow. But on the other hand, considering all the other uh, priorities, I think we are just like you. We are fighting to, uh, to still put open access back on the, uh, on the table when it comes to research and innovation. So in summary, open access and all the measures related to open access uh, are not a goal in themselves, but it's just a means to improve the circulation of knowledge and therefore also to stimulate innovation in Europe. So constantly against the mantra, but it's a way also of educating the people you talk to. Uh, so open access to publication, this will be the general principle in Horizon 2020 and after the discussions with the member states and the parliament, there's no doubt about it. So it's good for all of us. We always have promoted green and gold open access measures. As you know, some countries like the UK, for instance, have very much promoted gold open access and we had some pressure also to go in some direction because it seems to be easier or because it answers better the, um, um, the need of some stakeholders. But we are very firm, we really want to continue to promote those two ways or even more, I mean, gold open access in a very broad term of uh, free access for the, um, for the reader, but when the costs are either covered by the author or by uh, any other institution in indirect way. Open access to data, there will be the pilot. And what is also very important is to go beyond the idea of open access, uh, create incentives and a culture of sharing and also measuring this culture of sharing, measuring the impact uh, on the career of the researchers, for instance. This is something where we don't really have a grasp on. This is beyond our remit but we really rely also on the, on the member states and the situation in universities and research centre to really um, make this um, stronger, really the rewarding the researchers for, for sharing their knowledge. I will stop here, just uh, with the, the last slide with some pointers. So our website, are not always easy to find, uh, so, and, uh, you know, Europa, so the, the, the main uh, website, you have Research, Science, Society, which is our work program, and you will find Open Access. Open Air is always a very good source of information. You have uh, my contact and those of my colleagues, and uh, Twitter is also quite, uh, quite important for us because it's a good way to relay the information that we post on our website. I'm going to be here for the whole day. So uh, I'm not taking questions now, I suppose, but uh, I will be very happy to, to talk to anyone later. Thank you. Thank you.